thank you I'll, all I'll for coming. Our um, guest speaker uh, is Tom Sanzone, who's general manager of Hamilton Sunstrand Space, Land, and Sea in, in Houston. Tom uh, started his career as a young man from Waterbury, Connecticut, came here Villanova and graduated in electrical engineering in, in 1968 and went directly to work for Hamilton Standard at the time, right? right. Hamilton Standard. And uh, which became Hamilton Sunstrand and uh, went directly to the uh, Johnson Space Center in Houston. He trained the Apollo 11 astronaut Neil Armstrong and the majority of the other Apollo astronauts as well in the use of the uh, company's portable life support backpack that was worn on the moon. I later became the company's Houston engineering manager for the Space Shuttle Extravehicular Mobile Unit, uh, or spacesuit, and has served as the company's Houston office general manager since 1986. He has a number of special honors from NASA, an exceptional public service medal, uh, astronaut silver Snoopy award, and the uh, NASA Group Achievement Award numerous those. He's gotten the United Technologies Corporation Chairman's Award and, uh, uh, and is a member of the Houston chapter of the Villanova Alumni Association and a, uh, probably one of the biggest Villanova basketball fans I've met <laughs> since, <laughs> since coming here. And, uh, um, and we're very happy to have Tom here to, to endure our winter. He that hasn't had winter in Houston. <laughs> For some reason, that may be the only place in the country that hasn't had winter yet. And so we're delighted to have Tom and his wife, Brenda, who has joined us as well. So, Tom. Thanks, Gary. And, and Brenda is probably the second biggest Villanova basketball <laughs> fan here. And next to her is Charlie Talkowski, who is another really huge basketball fan. And Charlie was my roommate for three years at Villanova. So. He just recently retired. He lives in, in uh, northern Delaware. And uh, we went to the game last night, which Brenda said I can't talk about. But we also went to the, we also went to the game Saturday. So uh, I will be retiring my favorite Villanova sweater that's now 0-3 in the last three games. So that's the last time I'll, I'll be wearing that. Uh, you know, you often hear speakers say, well, it's an honor to be here. And uh, I, I say that quite literally. Uh, Charlie probably, more than anybody, is like probably shaking his head because the, there were times where uh, we wondered if I, we together wondered if I'd ever graduate from this place and uh, had some serious doubts. And I think it was my mother saying the rosary every day for the four years I was here that really, that really did the trick. So it really is an honor to be here. Um, Dr. Gabriel and I actually met at the Final Four, so that was kind of the connection to basketball. And uh, we, we hadn't known each other before. We had lunch together and talked a little bit about our backgrounds and uh, found that we had a lot of things in common. Uh, we both love cars and car racing, and we're both members of the Sports Car Club of America. And obviously, the Villanova basketball tie in Detroit and so as much as I would love to say I'm here for National Engineers Week, I'm really here because Gary said, why don't you pick a basketball game you'd like to come up to and then you can do a talk. <laughs> and I looked at the schedule and uh, obviously preseason we all thought UConn would be just as good as they were last night. And I said the UConn game. And then uh, a little bit later when I looked at the schedule, I said to Brenda, you know, Providence is playing two days before in the Wacombia Center, so I'm going to drop a couple of days early. So we've done that. We usually make it up uh, at least one game a year, uh, you know, for basketball, and then uh, ideally someplace like Detroit or this year Indianapolis would be a nice place to visit. So, uh, so when Gary and I were talking in Detroit, it was uh, approaching the 40th anniversary of Apollo 11, and uh, that's when he contacted me a little bit after that. And, said, you know, I'd like you to come up and, and talk to the students about NASA and your career and, and what's going on. And then when I picked those two games, he, he said, hey, that's National Engineers Week. So uh, it, all, it all kind of fit together. Uh, one, of, one of the things he asked me to do was talk a little bit about my personal background, uh, some focus on Apollo 11, the historical focus, uh, spacesuit development over the years, 
and then maybe some lessons learned, uh, personal lessons learned that I've had over almost 42 years now. So that's what I'm gonna, that's what I'm gonna try to do. Uh, you can see the title from Talatine to the Moon. Uh, probably 90% of my classes were in Talentine. There was no Sear, there was no this building, there was no South Campus, there was no West Campus. And, and we, Charlie and I thought we were pretty modern when we got here. But one of the things that I've said to Charlie over the years is, uh, you know, Charlie, if you really want to feel old, think about how we related to the classes before us. Uh, if an alum was talking, and I've done this calculation, and this is incredibly depressing, but when we were freshmen, it was the same way we would relate to the class of 1918, the way you would relate to me today. So as much as I hate to say that, it's, it's pretty depressing, but uh, one of the things with Villanova is it's kind of ageless, and, and things, uh, ageless in a good way. And uh, although there's new buildings, the spirit of Villanova never changes. Uh, you know, you go to the chapel, you go to Talentine, you walk the halls. Uh, and I'll actually share a quick story that I shared with Cindy yesterday. And Gary hasn't heard this one, but uh, uh, I struggled so much in school that <clears throat> I guess I was probably a junior and I was on the second floor of Talentine and I saw these two adults walking down the hall. And I thought, if I ever graduate, I'm going to come back and walk down that hall, knowing that I can just keep on walking. And I never visit here that I don't walk down that second floor of Talentine Hall. So uh, anyway, it's, it's uh, absolutely great to be here. The, uh, the Talentine to the Moon theme, uh, it's actually tough when the highlight of your career happened 14 months after you started working, and you've been working there for 42 years. But we actually landed on the moon 14 months after I graduated from Villanova. It was really, you know, an incredibly exciting time. So uh, this, is the, this is the little personal background on myself. And I said to uh, Cindy that uh, we have a communications person in our, in our company who's very creative and absolutely uh, on the other end of the spectrum of creativity from myself. And so she said they have a new vice president. He came in and he did this. Uh, kind of chart like this on the pluses and the minuses in his life. And uh, she said, I think that's what we'll do. So I gave her some pluses and minuses, and uh, we actually culled the pluses because I'd be here all day if I went through all the pluses in my life. So it really got me thinking about you know, how, how positive my life has been and how few negatives I've had to deal with. Uh, so we'll, we'll take a, a shot at going through this really quickly. As Gary said, I was, I was uh, born in Waterbury, Connecticut. Um, the, the, one of the highest things on there is graduating from Villanova. Uh, uh, higher than the next one that you see, which is Apollo 11 and Neil Armstrong, because I had not graduated from here, I would not have been involved with Apollo 11 and Neil Armstrong. Um, the, uh, the thing with Apollo was we were all incredibly young. Everyone who worked at NASA was incredibly young. And I do a leadership presentation that I've given at NASA, and one of the slides is to delegate more to young people. We, we tend not to trust young people. Uh, and NASA has gone from this very young agency to a very old agency, where now, if, you know, everybody's my age, and they're all retiring, you know, and, so the younger folks need more responsibility. Uh, but to put it in perspective, what we call the front room of mission control, the room that you saw when people were you know, out on the moon, or most of you saw a video of it uh, long after you were born, uh, the average age in that front room on Apollo 11 was 26 years old, which is pretty amazing. Uh, and one of the, I know one of the flight directors very well, his name is Glenn Lunny, and and I had told this story for quite a long time about how young everyone was and that the average age was 26. And, but I had never really confirmed it. I don't know where I got it from. So I asked him, is that really true? Was that really the age? And he said, not only was it true, he said, I was one of the flight directors and I was 28. <laughs> so, I mean, that's who put us on the moon. The oldest flight director was 35. Gene Krantz of Apollo 13 fame. Many of you have probably seen the movie Apollo 13. He was, I think, about about 35. So 
Uh, Gary mentioned the Silver Snoopy. Uh, Snoopy was a mascot, and, and actually still is, in the space program. And it, uh, it's, it's the highest award that an astronaut gives. It, it, it goes to 1% of the workforce. And so I was, I was very honored to receive that in, in uh, 1970, and it's still very special to me. Apollo 14 is up there because it is the only Apollo launch that I actually got to witness. Uh, Alan Shepard, who was the first American in flying space, was actually the, also the uh, commander on Apollo 14. And it was, uh, it, was, it was an amazing sight. I mean, shuttle launches are fantastic. I've seen seven of them. If you can somehow fit it into your schedule, there's only four left. Uh, and uh, it, it's just an indescribable thing. Uh, I mentioned that Gary and I are both into cars, and, and uh, I actually started racing Formula Fords in the Sports Car Club of America uh, in 1979, and I did that for 12 years, and I'm still very interested and very passionate about racing and follow all kinds of, all kinds of races. So one of the, one of the first downers, uh, certainly in my professional career, was uh, for the Space Shuttle program, uh, we were the prime contractor, our company was the prime contractor for what's called the Extravehicular Mobility Unit. One of the things that you'll find is that NASA uses hundreds of acronyms. Uh, and they don't call anything by its normal name. You know, they don't call a rocket a rocket, they call it a launch vehicle. They don't call a space it a space it, they call it an Extravehicular Mobility Unit. So with, with words like that, nobody wants to go around saying Extravehicular Mobility Unit for the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. So we say the NASA EMU, and it's like a different language. Uh, but we were getting ready for, for the very first shuttle spacewalk on the fifth shuttle mission, and we had failures in each of the two life support systems, two different failures. And it, it was really one of the low points of my career. I mean, they were design issues, but there's tremendous pride and there's tremendous teamwork at NASA. So one of the things that we all felt was we, we let the team down. Uh, we have a term called go for EVA, and we had these giant signs. The astronaut office building was right opposite our office building, and we had these great big signs in the windows, go for EVA, and obviously we didn't do the EVA. Uh, I probably should have put as, a, as the next upper uh, Another thing that I've learned at working at NASA, and that's never give up. I guess maybe I learned that here. <laughs> never give up. Uh, because, you know, just keep plugging, keep plugging, and things will work out. And uh, we had worked with an astronaut by the name of Story Musgrave in the development of the uh, space shuttle spacesuit. And we had worked with him for years. And we all assumed that he was going to do the very first sp shuttle spacewalk on the sixth shuttle mission. Well, when NASA decided to, to do the first spacewalk on the fifth mission, he, he wasn't going to get to do it. He was disappointed. We were all disappointed. He was kind of our guy. And uh, when, it, when it didn't happen on the fifth uh, mission, it got switched to the following mission. And uh, it was absolutely incredible that we were able to fix both problems quickly enough to be able to fly the next mission. And so the first person to do a space shuttle spacewalk was Story Musgrave. And uh, I talked to him about it afterwards, and I still remember him saying, Tom, the tide goes out, and the tide comes in. Story is very philosophical. He has, as one of my NASA bosses said, more degrees than a thermometer. And he has like <laughs> seven degrees, and he's a medical doctor, and he's really one of the most brilliant guys. Um, the next one on the upper is uh, the Great Barrier Reef. I'm a scuba diver, and so I got to dive in the Great Barrier Reef, which really wasn't as great as uh, Grand Cayman, in case you want to take up diving and make the trip shorter. But it was, it was a nice thing to check off. And then, uh, you know, one of the highest highs of my life, just a little below getting married, was uh, Charlie, Brenda, and I were in Lexington. Kentucky on the night of April the 1st, 1985, 25 years ago. It's hard to imagine. And uh, I don't need to tell this audience about that night, how special it was, but it was really, it was the epitome of never giving up, you know? It was, it was the spirit of Villanova. 
and uh, it, it's something that none of us will ever forget. Um, the next downer in my professional career was <clears throat> NASA consolidated a bunch of uh, uh, contracts, one of which was the spacesuit processing contract. Uh, it was ours to lose, and that's exactly what we did. You know, we lost it to Boeing, uh, and we laid off or transferred over 200 employees. It was really a tough time. And I suppose in the spirit of Story Musgrave with the tide going in and out, uh, my boss at the time decided to leave and I became the general manager. Um, you know, two decades later, that sounds like a great career move, but it wasn't so much fun at the time when we laid off 200 people, we had 25 people left, and you know, it was a tough time, but uh, we, made it, we made it back. Um, I ran my first marathon in 1986, and I ran my 34th last month, so still doing that. Uh, maybe that's some of the Villanova running stuff that uh, you know I, I picked up because when Charlie and I were seniors, uh, of course there were no women here <laughs> in 1968, but our men's track team were the uh, NCAA indoor champions and cross country champions, and uh, we had some really fantastic uh, runners. Uh, the next real downer was the, the Challenger accident. Uh, we had there had been one prior. A uh, serious accident at NASA, uh, what's called Apollo 1, where the three crew members died on the ground in the spacecraft in, a, in an oxygen fire. Uh, that was a few years before I, I joined the program, so I hadn't experienced that personally. Uh, but that, you know, that really hit home. One of the things that I share with people is when you work at NASA, it really is a family environment, particularly in Houston, where all the astronauts live and train, and you go to church with them, you go to sporting events with them, you see them in the grocery stores, they literally become your personal friends. So when you have an accident like that, it would be just like you guys losing classmates. And so it, it not only was a, was a professional loss, but it was a, it was a personal loss. Um, again, it was keep plugging, keep plugging, because if you, if you give up, you're done. And it was a tough uh, three years before we, we flew again. Uh, but the spirit of that team at NASA is something that you know, kept everybody going. My, my top bullet is finally giving up my bachelorhood after dating Brenda for more years than she or I would care to share with you. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I should share with you is that Charlie and I were both longtime bachelors. And uh, I'm not sure we ever made a bet on it when we lived in Sullivan Hall, but if we did, I won the bet because Charlie got married about five or six months before I did. <laughs> and uh, I was his best man, and he was my best man. So one of the things that you'll experience here at Villanova, and I'm sure you already are, is that you'll develop lifelong friends, literally lifelong friends. I mean, you, you hear that term, but it, it, it's, really, it's really true. Um, a lot of people would like to see or touch something that's flown in space, and uh, one of our very close friends, Nancy Curry, uh, who's an astronaut, when she made her first flight, uh, asked Brenda and me, you know, what would you like me to fly for you? So we, she flew our wedding rings for us. So our wedding rings have four million miles on them, <laughs> maybe four million one hundred thousand, something like that. So um, I would like to interject that he had a difficult decision. His Villanova ring. <laughs> <laughs> My Villanova ring was irreplaceable. So my ring was <laughs> just, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> uh, then the next big downer was the the Columbia accident. Uh, and, and you guys are old enough to, even the young ones are old enough to remember that. I, I, um, I didn't think that I would ever see another shuttle accident during my career or that NASA would continue after the second shuttle accident. Uh, I was in Connecticut uh, the day the accident occurred and uh, my mother, who was 99 years old and had just gone into a nursing home, I was trying to 
clear up her house and her belongings and I had, there was no TV, there was no radio and, and Brenda called me and told me what happened. And I really thought, you know, that's really the end of the program. And to NASA's credit, you know, they, they, they plugged ahead. And if you talk to any of these astronauts, they would be the first to tell you that they want the program to continue when something like that happens. Um, when I talked about Nancy Curry flying our rings, it was, although I had been at NASA for 25 years and thought I knew almost everything about NASA, uh, being so close with her, I learned things that uh, I never really thought too much about. Uh, she was a single mom at the time, and Brenda and I were the guardians for her five-year-old daughter. And uh, just her mental preparations for the fact that she may not come back. And it kind of drove home the risky business that we're, that we're in. So the, my, my uh, favorite quote is, is uh, from Thomas Paine, the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. It's uh, one of the things that I said to, uh, I think Father Peter was sitting five rows down from me and, last night, and, and I said, uh, you know, if you didn't have losses occasionally, the wins wouldn't mean anything. Uh, not that I want to be here with losses <laughs> occur, but uh, if they were easy, everybody would do it. You know, it's what, it's what makes it tough. So uh, my, my more recent high is, although Brenda and I don't have any children, we have surrogate grandchildren. Uh, and they're an absolute joy to us. Uh, one's five, one's four, and one's one and a half. The one and a half and the five-year-old are uh, brother and sister, and the other is the, the daughter of a single mom that Brenda used to teach with. And they're over our house all the time. And, and uh, I put my full name up there with the V in the middle because uh, many of my friends think that my middle name is Villanova. And uh, <laughs> this is a place where I, I can be open about it, you know. Uh, but Brenda, Brenda says I brainwash these kids. and, and uh, uh, Amelia, the four-year-old, was at our house the other day, and she had this Valentine shirt on. It had four blocks, and it said L-O-V-E. And she pointed to the V, and she said, Villanova! <laughs> so, <laughs> so I have, I have brainwashed them. Um, uh, about a year ago, I, I received a, a, a very high honor from the Rotary Award, uh, from the Rotary National Space uh, Award. And, uh, and then my most recent disappointment is actually the 2010 NASA budget, which came out a couple of weeks ago, and it calls for the termination of the Constellation program. And the Constellation program was intended to be the successor to the Space Shuttle program. Many of you know the Space Shuttle is, is uh, planned to be retired in four more flights uh, this year, and um, we had a, a program called Constellation that was going to be a capsule. It hasn't been voted on by the Congress yet, but it's a, there's, a, there's a tough road to hoe. Uh, and I don't want to make this a, a, you know, a political speech, but I, it was interesting that uh, in yesterday's uh, Philadelphia Inquirer, there's, a, there's an editorial, and uh, it's called Obama Retreats from Space. And I would suggest that you might want to read it, because it, it happens to express my own personal feelings. Uh, there's also a website that you might be interested in called Go NASA Boldly. Go, I'm sorry, GoBoldlyNASA.org. It has a lot of information of, about NASA, and it might, it might interest you. Okay. Um, as the slide said, some things don't change much. On the left, you see the old, what we call the old Mission Control Center. It's now a National Historic Landmark. Uh, and uh, everybody waving the flags, and it's interesting that it's in black and white. That's probably all we had back then. And then the control room on the right is our current control room, uh, where the technology is, as you might suspect, significantly improved. When we bring people into the old control room, uh, it doesn't have to be kids anymore. Even, even young adults look at these things with circles and holes on them and numbers, and they say, what is that? And it, that's a dial telephone. We had pneumatic <laughs> tubes that we would send messages from the back room. And uh, so some things don't change too much, at least from the outside, but spacesuit is a different story. So what you see on the left there is uh, a 1934 version of a spacesuit uh, done by Wiley Post. 
And uh, Wiley Post was an aviator, and uh, one of the things that he had discovered was that at high altitudes, he could fly faster. He could take use, you know, make better use of the of the jet stream. Uh, but he needed to be in a pressurized suit to survive. So he developed this first pressurized suit. And uh, so this was kind of the very first spacesuit. And then just to show you how strange development can be, the spacesuit on the right was a development unit for Apollo done by Republic Aviation. I personally wouldn't be too enthusiastic about walking around the moon on that with that uh, suit on. But it was, uh, it was part of the development process. So we've, we've come a long way. Uh, the very first NASA program was the Mercury program. You may have heard of the Mercury 7 astronauts. Uh, this was Alan Shepard. He did a, uh, what was called a suborbital flight. So we launched him, he went up higher than 50 miles, and he, and he came right, right back down. Uh, and so he had a pressurized suit really as a backup to the, to the pressure enclosure of the spacecraft. Uh, one of the things that uh, I find many people don't realize is that when Kennedy made his very famous speech about we're going to go to the moon, we don't do it because it's easy, we do it because it's hard, the United States of America had never orbited an astronaut in space. We had never orbited anybody. And this man had the guts to set this vision out of we're going to go to the moon and we're going to do it in this decade and we're going to bring the person back safely. And uh, that has gone down through the decades as one of the most powerful visions that's ever been put forth. Uh, one of the stories that I'd like to share with folks is Lyndon Johnson visited uh, what was then called the Manned Spacecraft Center. It was later named for him. And uh, he was taking a tour, and, and he uh, walked by a custodian. And he said to the custodian, what do you do here? And the custodian said, I help put man on the moon, sir. <laughs> and that tells you the power of vision. You know, if you have everybody pulling in the same direction, and they know where they're going, and they, they have the challenge, they know when they have to do it by. Uh, I, I've heard Armstrong say that they would be in meetings uh, and maybe get into a conflict about how they were going to do something, and maybe a slight debate would break out. And uh, he said the debate would always terminate when somebody would say, what are we here to do? We're here to put man on the moon by the end of the decade and return him safely. And the debate would stop, and they would move on forward. So uh, the power of vision is, is incredible. Uh, the Gemini program was next. Uh, astrologically, the Gemini, Gemini is the twins, and so we went from a single space, single person spacecraft to a two person spacecraft. Uh, this happens to be a picture of Ed White and Jim McDivitt. Uh, again, for the most part, their spacesuits were what we call intravehicular, inside the inside the spacecraft for backup uh, life support system. But Ed White actually became the first American spacewalker. Uh, and it was really kind of a stunt at the time. Again, it was, I was here in Tallentine when it happened, I think, uh, trying to figure out how I was going to graduate. But um, it was really done as a stunt. We were in a, in a race with the Russians, and the Russians were beating us on everything. And they actually did their spacewalk before ours, uh, Alexei Leonov. Uh, and it was, it, was kind of a risky, it was kind of a risky thing. Uh, but Ed White was the, was the first one, and, and when I was putting these slides together, uh, one of the guys I work with was looking at him, and, he's, and he, this is kind of the small world nature of working at NASA, and he said, did I ever tell you that Ed White was my father's best friend and his roommate at West Point? I said, no, I never remember hearing that. And that's the kind of, that kind of stuff comes up all the time, so. Okay, uh, one of the acronyms, um, the one acronym you got to leave here with today, other than NASA, which I think you already know, although you may not know what it stands for, National Aeronautics and Space Administration, is EVA, and that's what NASA calls a spacewalk. Uh, the next EVA is in a couple of hours, believe it or not. There's folks up there right now, they've done two in the last week, and their third and last one for this mission is planned tonight. 
And so EVA is extravehicular activity translated to be spacewalk. And so this is some of the system's evolution, particularly during the Apollo era. Uh, the concept suit on the left, where it says ILC, ILC is actually a company in Delaware. Originally headquartered in Dover, Delaware. Now they're in Frederica, Delaware, a little bit south. And during the Apollo program, ILC was the prime contractor for the spacesuit. And the company that I worked for, Hamilton Standard back then, was the prime contractor for the life support backpack. And uh, it was literally a backpack. It had straps that went over your shoulders and around your waist, and it had hoses that came around and plugged in. Uh, and, and so we obviously worked very closely with ILC, and we have for, for many decades. So much so that when the space shuttle uh, spacesuit contract was, was put out by NASA, um, we actually teamed with ILC, and NASA said, no, we're only going to have one contract this time, you know, for the whole thing. So uh, Hamilton Sunstrand is the prime contractor, but ILC is, a, is our major teammate. It still does most of the soft goods part of the suit. Uh, so you can see the, uh, the Apollo 11 photo here, and one of the things that's uh, kind of interesting, might be interesting to you, is if you look right here in the reflection of the visor, you'll see Neil Armstrong taking this picture of Buzz Aldrin. Well, Neil Armstrong had the camera. There was only one camera. He had it. So that's the photo of Neil Armstrong on the moon, the reflection in Buzz Aldrin's visor. Uh, you might see some uh, video that's been converted or something like that, but no really good uh, still photos. And then on the far right, uh, MMU is another acronym. It stands for Manned Maneuvering Unit. And uh, this was uh, uh, Bruce McCandless. And I, I've got this slide a little bit later. I'll talk a little bit more about it. OK, this, this one's kind of busy. Gary asked me not to get too technical, and, and I'll try not to. But he also wanted me to talk a little bit about the challenges that we face. And the basic challenges uh, were the environment. Uh, we take our environment so much for granted, and I don't just mean the, the green part of our environment. I'm talking about the pressure around our bodies, 14.7 pounds per square inch. We never think about it. Uh, the, the CO2 that we're giving off, and what happens to that CO2 that we don't rebreathe it, you know, we use photosynthesis. And, and uh, so all those things we, we, we take for granted, and um, we had to provide all those things. And so I'll, I'll try to touch on, you can see many of these components here. Uh, this oxygen regulator and primary oxygen supply bottle. We had an oxygen tank that was charged to 900 PSI, and we dropped the pressure to just a little bit less than 4 PSI, and that was 100% oxygen. And that was the pressure that the astronaut needed to survive in the spacesuit. So that was the pressure we provided him. Uh, the temperature in the spacesuit, uh, in space, the temperature varies in very round numbers from plus 250 degrees Fahrenheit to minus 250 degrees Fahrenheit, depending on whether you're in the sun or the shade. So some people say, that's 500 degrees. And so in the shuttle program, when we're doing a spacewalk, and we're going around the Earth every 90 minutes, the temperature extremes that the astronaut's experiencing are 500 degrees. Uh, so the spacesuit is really like a fabric thermos bottle. And uh, I, I brought a sample swatch. I'll leave it down here for you to take a look at it afterwards. But it's got, it's got 11 layers of, of uh, insulation. So, one of the challenges that we had was, okay, if you're inside this thermos bottle, I know none of you have ever gone to a crowded fraternity party, but if you ever do, <laughs> even in the winter, it gets very warm if there's a lot of people in there. That's what happens inside the spacesuit because your body gives off a lot of heat. So the challenge became, how do we get rid of that heat? And the answer was, we have the astronaut wear an undergarment with 300 feet of plastic tubing called a liquid cooling garment. And then we circulate chilled water at four pounds a minute. Uh, and he can, he can regulate how much of that water goes to a heat exchanger. And so that's the way we take the heat out. We, we don't have a heater. We don't need a heater. The heater is the, is the human body. Uh, 
now we had to get rid of that heat, and there's a, there's a thing right here called the sublimator. Uh, and I imagine most of the engineering students know what sublimation is. It's going from solid to gas without passing through the liquid state. And in the vacuum of space, that's what happens with water. So this sublimator had absolutely no moving parts. We still use the same technology today. It's one of the neatest things I've ever seen. It's, a, it's a, called a porous plate sublimator, and it's totally self-regulating. And so we provide water from a, from a water tank, uh, and we put it under pressure, it goes up, it tries to escape through these pores, and then as soon as it hits the vacuum space, it freezes and it makes an ice layer. Then there's a barrier uh, layer, and the heat is transferred across that barrier layer, layer and it's totally self-regulating. The more heat you put in, the more ice sublimates. And so when you, if you ever hear NASA talking about you running low on water, it's not drinking water, it's the water that we send to our heat exchanger. Still use similar technology today. Um, CO2 removal, there's a thing here called lithium hydroxide canister. And I, I told Cindy yesterday, the only thing I remember from my two semesters of chemistry here was, and, and, and Charlie's a PhD chemist, so I, I don't know why I had so much. Oh, I know why, because I was a freshman when I was taken, and Charlie and I became <laughs> as a sophomore. Uh, lithium hydroxide plus carbon dioxide yields lithium carbonate and water. Did I get that right, Charlie? Uh, basically, it means that we have this chemical and it absorbs the CO2. Because the life support system that we use is a recirculating system. It's not like a scuba system. It's not like you dump it out overboard. So we want to rebreathe the oxygen that hasn't been consumed by the body. And we let that uh, carbon dioxide go and get absorbed by the, the, the uh, lithium hydroxide. Um, ventilation. Uh, we're in this suit. When we, if we don't have a way to ventilate the suit, that CO2 is going to sit right in front of your face. So we have a fan, and the fan turns at 19,000 RPM. Uh, creates about six cubic feet a minute of flow, and it goes across your whole body and goes up to the lithium hydroxide canister, and, and uh, that's how we get rid of the CO2. We also had 12 channels of telemetry to monitor all this stuff, communications. Uh, warning system, uh, battery to power these things, um, ways to collect body waste because you're going to be in the suit for a long time. And uh, so your whole world is basically in the suit and, and uh, driven by that life support system. So those are, those are some of the challenges that we face. Uh, obviously here is a young Neil Armstrong. He was 38 years old at the time. I was 22. Uh, I thought he was an old man. I'd kill to be 38 now. But, uh, this is him in the spacecraft on Apollo 11. Uh, this is me uh, actually wearing the Villanova uniform at the time. Uh, white shirt, skinny dark tie. We did wear ties and jackets to class. Horn rim glasses. And uh, what we are doing here, I'm really glad somebody took this photo. What we are doing here is looking at digital data on a TV monitor hand plotting the data on graph paper. <laughs> I know this is so foreign to you. It's pretty foreign to me. And you can see these yellow bands. Uh, those were the bands where we expected the data. I said we had about 12 channels of telemetry, like suit pressure and oxygen quantity and things like that. And so we would hand plot the data. And if it went outside that yellow band, you know, we'd say, hey, we got something we need to take a look at. So uh, this is the young. Armstrong and the young Sanzone uh, getting together about five years ago at a banquet in, in Houston. So since then we've dyed our hair white, which is you know, <laughs> prestigious. And, uh, but it's it's uh, it's it's been. I had a fantastic uh, career, and 40 years or 42 years goes by so fast. I know you hear this from every adult you ever talk to, but it's true. I mean, it just goes by so. And the older you get, the faster it goes. That's the other thing. Uh, after Apollo 11, uh, this happens to be a photo of Apollo 15, and one of the one of the big changes that we made in the life support. So we actually made a lot of changes. Uh, we went from a four-hour life support system to a seven-hour life support system, and this was the first mission that we flew the lunar rover vehicle. Uh, and this this happens to be Jim Irwin 
standing on the moon who happened to be uh, one of my one of my personal favorites. But it's a it's a great photo, and obviously we. Uh, I hope it's not deja vu all over again, but we were actually scheduled to fly 20 the, through Apollo 20, and uh, President Nixon canceled the program after Apollo 17. So if you're ever in Houston, and Kristen, you've been in Houston and seen the Saturn V, um, the Saturn V that's on display in Houston is Apollo 18. So it's a little bit of a sad story that that thing should have gone to the moon, and I, I hope we're not doing the same thing over again. Uh, this is a very busy chart, and I've got some handouts that uh, when, when we're done, you can come down and, and pick them up. This is one of them, but, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to spend very much time on this, particularly since there's a handout, but you get an idea of all the layers of the spacesuit. Uh, this, is the, this is the key thing. Uh, we like to say the suit is not a large garment. It's a small spacecraft, and when you think of it in that context, uh, it kind of takes on a new connotation. One of the great things about working on this system is, as opposed to working on the shuttle itself, Kristen's friend works on the tiles. There are experts everywhere. Uh, in the extravehicular activity area, it, it's a little bit like Villanova. It's small enough that you know everybody. And, and it's very rewarding. I mean, we know the trainers, you know, we know everybody that's involved. So. Uh, very rewarding. So the heart of the suit is called the hard upper torso. One of the big changes from Apollo to shuttle is in Apollo, every astronaut had his own custom-made spacesuit with his name on it. Actually, they had three: a training suit, a flight suit, and a backup suit. When we got into shuttle, and we got into many, many more astronauts, NASA recognized, you know, we can't afford to build everybody through spacesuits. So the spacesuit is very modularized, and uh, it's like going to a tailor shop and saying, "Here's a lower arm." I mean, a a lower arm, an upper arm, a lower waist, an upper waist, you know, and we basically put a thing together and tweak it for them and we let them use it when it comes back, we take it apart, put, put it back in the bins. Uh, the technology up here in the life support system is, is uh, similar. Uh, we now use a, a technology called metal oxide uh, to replace lithium hydroxide just because it saves us weight, bringing all that weight up. Uh, but many of the things are similar because the challenges, the challenges are the same. This is the, um, the epitome of the, of the uh, spacecraft, you know, the small spacecraft. Um, now when astronauts go out, you know, they're always tethered. Uh, we do have a little backup system, thruster system on there in case they became disconnected, they could kind of fly back to the shuttle. Uh, but this, this was pretty hairy back in 1984 to send somebody 300 feet away flying this thing. And the man maneuvering unit was literally a jet pack. And so Bruce McCandless flew this thing out about 300 feet. And it's, it's one of the more famous uh, NASA photos. Um, just this past summer, we had our final Hubble Space Telescope repair. Uh, I find many people are more familiar with uh, Hubble Space Telescope pictures than just about any NASA pictures. Um, three of the four guys who did the spacewalks are, are close personal friends of mine, one from church. And so this was a special mission. There's a, there's a show on PBS, I think you can still access it online. Uh, I don't remember the time, I think it's a NOVA show. It's a great show to show you how difficult doing things in space really is. Because uh, one of NASA's greatest sins is making this incredibly difficult thing appear easy. And uh, that show was, when I watched it, I just thought it was, it was fantastic. If you do get to watch it, there's a, there's a young blonde woman named Christy Hansen, uh, who's one of the two uh, EVA uh, instructors that works with the crew all the way through choreographing their, their planning for spacewalk. And uh, Christy is a Villanova graduate. So uh, we're about the only two. <laughs> uh, but you'll, you'll, you'll see her in there. I hope you get to see the show. Um, this is one I, I put in here for International Space Station. 
somebody else actually pulled the photos for me. I just said, you know, give me a space station photo. And this is the, the uh, Columbus module. And uh, as I said, the space station should be completed in four more flights. Uh, this is Randy Bresnik. And I didn't even know it was in the photo at first. And I said it was in the photo. And he said Randy Bresnik. And I said, oh my gosh, I work with his wife. You may have heard that while he was in space, his wife gave birth. And uh, I actually work with a, her, his wife is an attorney, a NASA attorney. Okay, next generation spacesuit, and I hope we actually get to do this, but it's a, it's a little bit questionable at this point. Uh, and again, I won't go through any of the details here, but the current spacesuit and life support system was designed in the late 70s. Uh, we've made some improvements over the years. But this is a leap forward, particularly in uh, mobility and, and uh, the ability to use this, this suit for an ejection suit, if necessary, or a, a spacewalking suit on the moon. Uh, we are actually teamed with the prime contractor, or partnered with the prime contractor, Oceaneering. And uh, we'll have to see what happens with Constellation and NASA's plans to see what actually happens with this uh, suit. Okay, just a couple of uh, lessons learned, um, and this doesn't necessarily relate to space, although that's where I've learned most of these things, working at NASA. And I got thinking about the fact that as a student, um, your success is largely determined by your own personal performance. Everybody's very grade-oriented, and you've got to study for the test, and nobody helps you with the test. I know there's team projects and things like that, but for the most part, it's your grade. And uh, I would just caution you to be prepared mentally for the fact that once you get your first job, no one will ever ask your GPA again, as long as you live. They will just care about how you're performing. Obviously, those high GPAs will get you a good job, uh, but they won't keep the job for you if you don't work as hard as you possibly can. Uh, so. That, that's, that's one of the things, be prepared for that uh, transition. Uh, when I do this leadership presentation at NASA, this is really the theme. It's all about people. Everything you're going to deal with is about people. Uh, I, I forgot to jot this down, but I, I want to give public credit to Joe Petrick, who Charlie might remember. Joe was, I haven't seen him since we graduated. But Joe was the guy that lived in Sullivan Hall. It was a double E uh, on, on this side of the classroom, Gary, when I was on this side. And I, would, I learned more from Joe than from all my professors combined. Because I would go down, Joe, you've got to explain this to me. <laughs> and uh, between my mother's rosary and Joe Petrick and Charlie helping me study for exams, yeah, that's what got me through. Uh, but what you see here is obviously an astronaut crew. And again, these photos were kind of pulled uh, somewhat randomly. Uh, but Nicole Stott here happens to be one of the parishioners in our church. The church we go to is across the street from NASA, so not surprisingly, most Catholic astronauts are in our, and are in our, are in our parish. Uh, and we just built a new church, in, uh, was dedicated in August, and uh, the stained glass, it's not exactly stained, are images from the Hubble Space Telescope. That's what the stained glass is. So next time you come to Houston, Go across the street to Nassau Bay and get to see it. Uh, Mike Good, who's one of our uh, parishioners who did the spacewalks on uh, the Hubble repair, actually took up uh, the Luna, which is the centerpiece of the Monstrance. And that's what we have in our church. He took it up on, the, on his mission with him, and he took up a Vatican flag as well. So behind these crew members, what you see here are flight controllers in the front room, or flight control room is the official name for it. And for everybody in here, there are people in back rooms, and the back rooms have back rooms, and um, it's, an incredible, it's an incredible team to be a part of. Um, this is actually my favorite space photo. This is Sonny Williams. Any runners out there? Serious runners? Okay. Um, Sonny Williams is a neighbor of ours and a good friend, and uh, I would run every morning, and I would see her almost every morning with her dog, and she's a very serious runner herself. Uh, when she was on the space station for six months, 
she actually ran the Boston Marathon on the treadmill in the space station as an official entrant in the Boston Marathon. <laughs> so if you want to look at Runner's World magazine last month or the last edition, it has her picture in there. And when she came back, she said her shoulders were killing her because she's running in zero gravity, so she had this harness to hold her down. So her legs were no problem, but her shoulders were killing her. <laughs> this photo uh, is one that she sent me from the, from the space station. And um, a lot of people don't realize that we actually have the ability to email you know, astronauts and stuff if, if, you're, if you're on their list. Uh, so uh, one morning I was out running, and, and Sunny was driving down the road. I would often see her there. And I said, I thought you had a vacuum chamber run today. And she said, I do. And I said, OK, I'm going to come over. She said, I'm driving in right now. And I said, I'm going to come over and watch you. I said, I used to sit on console for years. I haven't been over there in years and years, and I'm going to come over. Well, by the time I got over there, she had, just, she had already completed her training run. She was out of the suit. She was inside the vacuum chamber, and her suit was hanging and she was doing the, because it's pretty heavy on the ground, and she was doing the post spacewalk servicing, changing the battery out and recharging with water and the oxygen. So I watched her on the uh, TV monitor before she came out, and the last thing she did was she went up and she hugged the spacesuit that was hanging in the chamber. When she came out and walked down the ramp, I said to her, um, I've been here a long time, I've never seen an astronaut hug a spacesuit before. <laughs> And uh, she said, well, that suit's got to be good to me, so I've got to be good to that suit. <laughs> so Sunny actually set the female record for uh, time spacewalking on this mission. And uh, two days after her third and last spacewalk, in my email uh, came uh, an email from her from the space station. And, it, and the, the title, it had, it had no words. It just, the title said, keeping me safe and sound. And it had a photo. This was the photo. And the caption under the photo was, love my suit. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I worked there for 42 years. I mean, stuff like that, you just, you know, you just, you can't get it anywhere else. Um, this, is, um, this is my message to really everybody, not just young people, but old people as well. Uh, the golden rule. If you treat people with the golden rule, you'll be golden and they'll be golden. And what, what I find is many people think that the golden rule is a Christian thing. And what you can see here are the quotes from the various religions uh, on how they all say the same thing. And they all say, treat your neighbor like yourself. If you do that, you'll, you'll nail it. You will absolutely nail it. Uh, now, I, I had a, a co-worker who joined the company, and, and I, he, had, he had, prior to that point, actually been my biggest customer. And uh, he retired from NASA, and we hired him, and uh, we were introducing him to our senior staff, and I said, why don't you just share your values, because I had worked with this guy for years. Uh, and so he talked about the golden rule, and uh, he and I had never talked about it. And so I said, you know, I had this thing in my uh, office, basically a version of this thing, and he said, oh, you must have, you must have read Maxwell's book. And I said, no, I, I haven't read Maxwell's book. And he said, yeah, he's got it in a few other, re a few additional religions. So I bought Maxwell's books, one of these little tiny leadership books. And, and the title is strange. The title is, There's No Such Thing as Business Ethics. And the reason for the title is, you don't have business eth ethics and church ethics and home ethics and school ethics. You only have ethics. So that's where the title came from. So I bought the book literally to see what additional religions he referred to. And in, but then I thought, well, I'll just read the book. It was pretty short. And I came across something that, that really kind of struck a nerve with me. He said uh, he's been doing leadership studies for years and years. And no matter what group or organization he works with or talks with, he finds that everybody needs those six things. They need to be valued, appreciated, trusted, respected, understood, and not taken advantage of. And that's kind of the essence of the golden rule. That's how we want to be treated. So if we treat others that way, um, it, it pays off tremendous dividends. Okay, this is... Uh, this is kind of a backwards chart for me because uh, I, I was part of a, 
an organization at the Johnson Space Center called the Joint Leadership Team. Um, about 80% of the employees at the Johnson Space Center are contractors, and 20% are government civil servants. And the center director decided that he wanted to put together a senior level group, and so he took his senior staff and the heads of each of the companies that are down there, and we formed a thing called the Joint Leadership Team. Uh, as part of that team, and, and we've been meeting for three, four years, uh, there was a decision made that they wanted uh, expected behaviors. It started out as a code of conduct, and, and we ended up translating into this uh, expected behavior. So I got to co-chair this, this team that was putting this thing together. And uh, I know it's an eye test, and I won't make you read all that. But basically, it says, be accountable, open-minded, trustworthy, and respectful. Uh, and we started with the NASA core values, and they are safety, teamwork, integrity, in support of mission success. Well, I was given this leadership presentation last month at the Johnson Space Center, and uh, it hit me the night before. I had given it once before. It hit me the night before. And there's probably nobody here that doesn't know Veritas Unitas Caritas, I hope. <laughs> and. Uh, it struck me how those Villanova values tied to these values. And it was literally by accident I, I thought about this. And if you think about Veritas, you know, truth, integrity, uh, uh, Caritas, Unitas, teamwork, you know, let's work together as one. And Caritas, in the business environment, you don't think of love very much. But we do it in the form of safety. You know, I talked about putting our coworkers and our friends in space. And um, we love those people. And we want them to be safe. And so the, the, you know, the greatest demonstration of love that we can give them is a safe spacecraft so that we have uh, mission success and they, and they come back <coughs> safely. Um, I had another, another kind of small world thing, uh, another astronaut friend by the name of Leroy Chow, and uh, I was emailing him, and I had, prior to that time, I, I had emailed some uh, shuttle astronauts, but their missions are so short, they never have very much time. But when you're up there for six months, they have time. So I sent Leroy an email before he ever got there, and I just said, welcome to the space station. And he responded like a day later, and so I responded to him. And we got into this letter writing thing, if you will. And while he was up there, we sent about 75 emails back and forth. And I was sending him basketball scores and things like that. Well, we were in the NCAA tournament, and uh, I said, I sent him a note, and I said, Leroy, I don't know if they're keeping you up on this, but you know, here's the latest scores. And, and I said, uh, my alma mater had a tough game last night. We won't even talk about it, but um, I, I said, uh, Villanova, you know, played this game, such and such. So he wrote back a, a day later, and he said, he's originally from California, and he said, my niece is a freshman at Villanova. So we had never, never talked about it. So this is 2005. So in that note, what he sent me was a photo that he took out the window, and there's Villanova. <laughs> and I know it's a little bit hard to see. There's a little close up here. <laughs> it's, it's up there. Um, you know, if you, if you, I can zoom it in on my own computer. You can actually, you know, make things out. But there it is. I mean, this is there's the blue roof. And there's a scoop right there, and yeah, the scoop go up here. And uh, I won't even dare try to point out it's there, but it is, it is there. So uh, uh, one of the things that I, I just mentioned about how much fun, it's hard work, but how much fun it is to work at NASA, because you get to work with people that do these kinds of things. And, and it's another major tip that I'll give you guys, and that's pick a job you love. Uh, Gary and I were talking yesterday about his daughter loves horses. And she's headed down toward a career in horses. And uh, if you end up in a job that you don't love, find another one. Because you're, you're working for a long time. And it makes a whole heck of a lot of difference if you love it or you hate it. And you definitely want one that you love. Um, OK, last slide. Uh, and, and this
this is kind of interesting in itself. I said I had somebody help me pull some of the photos together. And uh, she pulled these photos. And I, I talked to Cindy about this, but I had not talked to Gary. Uh, over here is, is Jack Drosdick. And I don't know if you've ever seen Gary's uh, email sign off. That's where I saw it. I went looking for an email he sent me. And it was after this was done. And I went, oh my gosh, Gary's the, the Drosdick Endowed Dean of Engineering. Well, Jack Drosdick was the CEO of Sunoco. Uh, one of the things that I found, Gary, was that uh, he moved, he graduated from Villanova in 65, so I was a freshman when he was a senior. Uh, he moved to Houston in 1968, same year I moved to Houston. I think he's made a few more dollars than I've made, but <laughs> he couldn't be more happy in what he, what he did. Uh, Maria Bello, I don't know if any of you are, are familiar with her, but she's an actress. Uh, that's been in quite a number of things, and, and one of the things that I discovered about her was she took uh, an acting class as a senior at Villanova as an elective, just for kicks. <laughs> and then she found that she loved it, and Brenda said to me, I wonder if Father Peter was her professor. And I don't know the answer, but she became a, a famous uh, actress. Uh, Deidre Imus is probably more well known as uh, Don Imus's wife. Uh, she happened to grow up in the same town that I did. We didn't know each other, but now she's an environmentalist and she's an author. And uh, one, of the, one of the books that she's written is uh, Growing Your Cleaning. And she also is the founder of the Environmental Center for Pediatric Oncology. So uh, all these Villanova folks, and I know Cindy was talking to me last night about how much Jack has given back to Villanova. He was also the chairman of the board of trustees of Villanova for about a year ago. Uh, Paul Kelly was the commandant of the Marine Corps. Uh, this guy is not an alum here in the uh, blue shirt, but probably more famous than all the others put together <laughs> on the page. And he will probably make more money than Jack Drostick. So uh, he could be the next endowed uh, dean of uh, business school, maybe. I'm not sure. Uh, and then obviously, uh, Andy Allen, obvious to me, I'm not sure how many of you guys know, you've probably seen the picture in the seer, but uh, for years at NASA, I had seen astronauts bring up their college banners and hang them in the show. And then when Andy got selected as an astronaut, and I, I never knew him before then, I, I went to talk to him before the mission, and not that he did this just for me, but I said, Andy, there's only one thing I want. I said, I want a picture of you holding up a Villanova banner. And that's it. <laughs> that's Andy holding up the Villanova banner. So uh, the message here is whether it's sports or business or being an astronaut or in the military or, or being an actress or an actor or an environmentalist, author, uh, whatever you do, uh, you want to love it. The, the education that you get in this university and probably more importantly, the values you get from this university will carry you to wherever your dreams want to take you. So thank you very much. Questions? Any questions? I'll pose a question to myself that might be out there that I didn't mention. One of the things that we make, my company makes, is the toilet system that flies on the shuttle. <laughs> and although it has nothing to do with spacesuits, uh, it is the most asked question <laughs> in the space program. How does the astronaut go to the bathroom? And then every once in a while, we'll have some uh, difficulty. It's actually not on wood. It's been quite some time since we've had any problems with it. But uh, the press loves it because the press are experts on toilets, but they're not very expert on life support systems. So they love to write it up, and if we have a problem, it's on the front page. And uh, so what we like to tell people is, take your toilet, no water, mount it on the ceiling, make it work. And that's, that's what we have to do in space. So uh, I won't go into the bloody details of it. But. In, in 1999, we had the ASME Regional Student Conference here at Villanova, uh -huh. and we had Dr. Flush Oh, Don uh, Retke. To explain it in graphic detail. Fantastic. <laughs> he did very well. Yeah, uh, his nickname, I've worked with him for many years. 
His nickname, actually had it on his badge as his nickname, was Dr. Flush. And, uh, <laughs> indescribable if you didn't see him. He's a real character. Yeah, he's a real character. And, and, and uh, uh, I think some people would be surprised how sharp of an engineer he really was. Because he would put this get up on and a yeah. white coat and a hat. Yeah. And, he had a briefcase with a flusher on the side. And, uh, he made it, if you work on a toilet system, you better make it fun. So, so one of the things that I, I like to tell folks is uh, there's no company that gets closer to the astronauts than we do. We make the suit that they wear and we make their toilet. You don't get closer to the companies than that. Any other questions? Nope. Yes, sir. Actually, uh, where does all the waste go? Like, does it get stored on